You know, we, we do um, uh, look at that quote from Winston Churchill and then modify it to say, we shape our cities, and therefore they shape us. And our cities, as you know, should be all the things that I know we talk about cities today, and there's many people that really talk about the cohesive and connected quality, the, the ability of cities to be vibrant and full of opportunities, and, and the ability of cities to be stimulating and inspiring. But, you know, when we work on cities, and we do master plans, and we do a lot of master plans now, we often ask ourselves, why do some cities have a better quality of life? Why do they work better? And why do they actually respond? Why do we respond to cities in a different way? And we believe that in our studio, we've kind of discovered some things that are not universal truths, but are ideas that might be lessons in terms of how you might make city architecture. And so what I like to do is go through a series of these things very quickly, and um, hopefully even the big meal, you don't kind of nod off. But we like to sort of talk about urban buildings, and the urban buildings are, we, we create because we do these things because they are the building blocks of the city themselves. And these buildings oftentimes reinforce the city structure of streets and blocks and open spaces, and they oftentimes articulate the programs that happen inside the building so that they are more than just anonymous containers. They have some personality to them. And they deal with natural light, view, uh, sometimes bringing landscape into them so that they become places of work and they deal with how you relate those places of either work or play or other functions to the city itself and to the neighborhoods. And I think I showed this one a little bit earlier and I, I mentioned that we had lost this competition, but it was a very good lesson for our studio because it talked about a way of how you could take the purpose of a building, the things that happen inside, the activities that we as human beings and treasure and learn and, and follow through with by then making a building that facilitated all those things instead of the other way around. And so in this theater school, we develop theatrical spaces throughout the building so that they can actually be in informal areas, they could be collaborating in nooks and corners, and then we brought it to the outside so it actually related to the city. And I think that aspect of making a gesture to the urban environment, to the city itself, so that the buildings actually have ability to engage the public is very, very important. And so when we actually develop other buildings that are mixed-use, and mixed-use is a big kind of universal truth that you want to have diversity and you want to have activities that 24-7, uh, you, sometimes you want to make sure that those pedestrian environments, pedestrian environments are as lively as possible and they actually have color and texture and all the good things about architecture that then support uh, the vibrant, mix, uh, vibrant uses that would go around it. And a lot of times we like to take those uses and make sure that no ugly parking garages are, are um, uh, on the blocks. And I think many of you know about that. And, and uh, we have lots of those in Chicago. But um, I think that people are learning that those things, the cars, are probably not really a part of the future, an important part of the future of, of the city, but it's going to be something that is really much secondary. We also think that buildings need to have craft to them. And it doesn't matter... Um, in terms of how much money you spend on finishes and surfaces, but it was that quality of excellence in construction, bringing back ideas that there's care taken. The worker actually and the, the designers actually treasure the ability to put together a building. And then to choreograph, what we call choreographing the, the scene of the streetscape in a way that uh, made it so that there weren't, wasn't buildings out of scale with each other. We think that's very important, and I just got back from Europe, and you know, the quality of small scale that relates to our size is, is I think, essential. For a new school that we, we developed in um, the University of California at San Diego, uh, it was based on that pedestrian scale, that ability of people, of a certain humanism in architecture, to understand how people use spaces, in this case a series of paths that cut through the campus, uh, and a series of spaces that then relate it to the quads uh, and the green spaces of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of this uh, medical school. We did this and organized this building so that it wasn't a building that we had a preconception about, but it was a result of how people use the space. And it, so it had a sheltered walk, it had a grand porch, it did had a, uh, I think a nice entry courtyard with a symbolic olive tree that became the heart to the school. Uh, we then uh, looked at how you can activate the ground level, because that's where it's the public realm. It belongs to the people. Uh, how you could activate that space with spaces that are, how you activate that architecture with spaces that are uplifting, connected to the outsides, uh, flexible, because these days it's all about trying to have spaces that double duty, and you can actually have many different kinds of uses in them. 
we actually know that food is a great uh, you know, common denominator, and so we put that at the intersection of many paths. So you get food, gathering, and study that work very well in a, in a school. And then you start to think about the rest of the spaces, and they actually told us that they don't believe that learning today is going to be the teacher to the student. It's, as you know, uh, it's learning communities. You learn in many different circumstances and situations and many different people. And so we have these spaces and then are imbued with natural light, with views. There's a visual transparency to the spaces. And then they all come back together to be connected in this academic, academic space. I think that uh, I mentioned materials and craftsmanship appropriate to a setting. I think that all those things uh, apply to a building, whether it's small like this, that has a, although it has a wonderful gathering space for many people, it applies to buildings like this that, uh, if they're thoughtful, potentially they can uh, create some inspiration. And so when we translate those ideas as a small building to the large building, this is where problems usually occur. And because oftentimes large buildings you know, are taken over by developers or taken over by people that want to make money. They're driven by economies. But can you create some things that give back to the city, which in this case we lifted the entire stock exchange up to create a dignified entry in a shadowy sort of courtyard that was out of the sun, had breezes moving through it. Then we carved out the tower so that it could actually become this great space at the top of the building that was a community that I mentioned. The president was able to see his vice presidents morning and evening and feel like it was a family of companies rather than being isolated. So this quality of then taking mixed use and incorporating art, a, a chapel, and, and certain kinds of finishes and local materials is all part, I think, of creating an architecture that's very specific and very much a part of that locale. Now, another idea that we have, I think, discovered and started to work on, and there aren't, it's not that there aren't other people working on this, is that how do you connect buildings together so they're not isolated? And so for a simple building like this, we thought about the spaces in between. It's really important to think of not only the object, but also the void. And so in that space of the gardens, we developed you know, really a wonderful network of open space. But then in this harsh climate, we then connected the two buildings together into a wonderful column-free saddle of glass that was full of art and landscape. And it became a new entry and a kind of gathering space between the two buildings that wasn't in the program, but it was actually part of something that they discovered really gave identity to this, this area. And so if you start to think about how one building could be combined, then you can start to think about hybrid buildings that then deal with sun, deal with the wind, deal with airflow, deal with a, a, a quality where it's really having a very strong identity, which in this case is three residential towers topped by a hotel that then allowed the residences to use those services and, and really create a city within this one, one structure. And this idea of then being able to have interconnected buildings then led us to an idea that can you actually take these buildings that are not your usual tower in a parking lot, but actually can relate to sometimes what we find are very small scale, very um, uh, much a, a, uh, an ancient sort of typo uh, typology of smaller buildings. And so there was a village, a very sort of famous village uh, in Shanghai that was right next to this large construction uh, all along the river. Of, uh, and we had an office, residential hotels, and retail. But we then thought about how you can take that village and take it vertically into the space so that it came, became a vertical village. And then we had a series of studies here that are kind of, to me, they're kind of amusing because uh, we actually even had a building that kind of looked like a cloud because it started to dematerialize in a way. But we discovered in the studio that, that this quality of breaking down the scale uh, had some allusions to that place. And then it also then created a, a, really a sense of thinking about the tall building in a different way than normal, that instead of an object, you actually thought about those voids and spaces that were contained within that object, and that those voids and spaces are terraces, open spaces, they're indoor-outdoor areas that can be used. Um, they created great, great view um, amenities for the different uses. And then they also uh, created a new perspective that you can then look at the city from. Uh, in this case, actually, there are windows that look down, down onto those villages down below. So we thought that was a good start to trying to mediate between the big and the small, between the old and the new. And then we, we think about cities in terms of how can you actually deal with infill sites that aren't 
sometimes the best sites, but what would you do? And so sometimes we talk about engineering density, which means that can you build something that, in this case, if you look at the slide, you see that building a little popping up and down? That building is searching for light and air and view. And so what we did was actually take that building, which is on a tiny little footprint, about the size of a house, um, but then raise it up on a tree trunk. And the idea of raising this idea of this building up on a tree trunk with these great cantilevered floors, taking advantage of the view and natural ventilation, and then also opening up the existing context where we left the historic facades so that you actually are being sensitive to preserving those areas and then creating more light and air to the pedestrians that would be moving in those, those retail areas down below. It gave us an idea about how you actually might use engineering integrated with architecture. And I think that if you think about building, it always is about really how structures are shaped by nature. And I think that when you think about sustainability and high performance, it always is about that. So when you, th when you look at this building that's on the Pearl River, it's very glassy to the river for great views. This building is, is an office. It's very slender, so that it had um, a great day lighting on both sides, so we can reduce the lighting loads within the building. But turning the building inside out with this small, small floor plate meant that we could do something that is always kind of the holy grail of an office building. How can you get rid of the dumb elevator where you're standing in there like this, you know, not looking at your neighbor and you know, just counting the seconds and moving up and down? So in this case, because we turned it inside out, we're able to get light and view into those elevator lobbies and, and light and view into the elevator cabs, light and view even into the restrooms, toilets, and pantries, and tea areas. So that it's a, as a new typology, to be able to think about nature, engineering, integrated together, connect to our garden and arcade, find transition spaces so that you're not going from hot to an air-conditioned space, but there's a natural transition that actually a very traditional and um, vernacular way of dealing with temperature. Created this building, which uh, has won a number of awards. We also have looked at other buildings that are even more technical, and in this case, uh, we like to call this the thermos, thermos bottle building, because it developed a structure that was very, very efficient, uh, a spiral, of, a double spiral of, of um, diagonal steel, which saved material and time. But then we wrapped it in another glass wall. So there's a double wall with a structure inside of it. And that double wall then enabled us to use the, air, the, temper, excuse me, the pressure differentials on the two sides of the building that always exist. And then because that temperature differ, I mean, the pressure differential is there, when air is introduced into that cavity, it pushes it along. And from our computer fluid dynamics, we were able to just study these things. And what it did, it actually allowed us to ventilate and reduce the ambient temperature of the, of the wall inside, which saved energy, increased daylighting, and really proved out to be a kind of a wonderful engineering architecture idea. And this building's under construction. And so this quality of using architecture engineering, which I believe will be the next steps for architecture today, is something that we're doing in the, what will be the 14th tallest building in the world. And it's based on many of the same principles that John Hancock that you see with the X bracing in Chicago has developed, but done in a new way so that it actually recognized the form of the building, which in this case is sensuous and matches the, the large floor plates for office and the smaller floor, floor plates for hotel and residential, but do, does it in a way so that it actually saved almost half the amount of steel that was in, done in a building uh, prior to this. And that was a big deal. It was a big deal for the, for the, um, the clients, and, and he said, well, I guess you earned your fee. So, <laughs> hooray. These ideas of trying to work with nature, and in this case, um, uh, reducing wind loads and seismic loads on the building, are the kinds of things that us as architects, engineers, designers, few really are the value we bring. And it's not, you know, I, I'm sure this building will be an icon for this town, but it's not starting out as trying to develop a form right, right off. Because what we feel is that you have to actually have something that is functional, something that has some sort of purpose, so something that adds value to it. And Vitruvius said, you know, it's firmness, commodity, and delight. And so how do you actually combine those three, three things together to actually make a place that all of us would have a memory of, have something that kind of hopefully inspires us? And we think that if you're able to develop buildings that think about all these things, in this case, a building that made a gesture to the city, uh, they wanted to have a museum that was tucked away in their upper-level mezzanine before that they brought out, showcased and framed. And we actually facilitated because we hung that museum to actually 
reduced the, the, the spans of this great glass wall. And this will made it as transparent as possible to, to accentuate that big gesture out to the intersection and back to the city. But then wrapped it in a wall that is about stone, which is Beijing, is like this is a city of stone. It's very environmental. Created a great aperture at the south that had a great bronze wall that then um, alluded to the bronze collection that was inside the museum. And then another opening, a portal, that then looked towards the Forbidden City to connect that headquarters back to each other. And it created a building that surprised to us. Um, they embraced so much because it represented the goals, mission, the whole um, culture of that particular company. And so if we're able lucky to actually combine engineering, design, architecture together, thinking about the city itself. In a, in a final bu- in building that I'd just like to show that we're actually um, uh, doing in Doha right now, sometimes you can invent the new. And I think that that is what we as designers are always looking for, is some way to innovate, to do something that uh, starts out and says, well, maybe you have a height limit that's taller than what you could build um, because you're limited by area, but let's use it. And let's carve away that building. Let's then tear those carved out voids so that actually those spaces then have great views. And then let's uh, clad it in a structural idea or an idea that really makes sense so that you actually have a tree trunk, like I talked about before, that then uh, hangs office spaces around, that then has a series of trays and terraces that are associated with a hotel that then spirals around this tree trunk in a way that opens up the views culminating in a, in a pool and, and uh, common facilities at the top, and creates a, uh, a building form that looks like it's carved out of the des- desert. And we know that because of these, these recesses, it allows us to have incredible shading, which is great. It allows the wind to move through these areas, which is also good. And it allows us to then to use the atrium of almost in a way that is the traditional uh, wind towers of the Middle East that is able to move air, natural air, around in a natural way, without energy. And so we looked at this, this idea of the atrium, and then I had a video that still doesn't work, but we were able to then bounce light down into that, that atrium so that, this is video, I'm waving my arms now, <laughs> the, the, the light is bouncing around, and it's actually creating this wonderful sort of concept of light, which is something that they have an abundant amount of, and, and then if it could animate these spaces, uh, whether it be the rooms, uh, which would have screen light, water, and sky, privacy, a great structural idea that's integrated and as part of us as, as um, that left brain thinking. Um, but it's also integrated with a very traditional idea of the, the screen. So that we create this mashabayas, which is a traditional word for the, the screen, the Islamic screens, and the Mogul garden at your, at your unit. And so this building is very sustainable, and I think it has a quality where it starts to talk about connecting to the city, having an architecture as, as technically advanced as possible because that in itself is going to, that performance is going to mean it's more efficient, it saves energy, and it's going to work better for the users. And, it, uh, and developing a building that hopefully has a character and a certain inventiveness or originality or uniqueness that will make it loved in wherever it exists. So thank you very much.